What's up, YouTube? Ride along with us on this episode of Cottywampa Overland as we explore 10 days in the incredible state of Alaska. We don't need a destination. Let's go where the river's taking us. Mm -hmm. time that either of us have ever been to Alaska and it's going to be the first time that we've ever overlanded in a Toyota. After a very early morning flight we made it to Alaska very tired but super excited to see what daylight would bring us. This is a bunch of overlanders completely completely out of their element. What are we doing? I'm getting an uber really early an in the morning uber early uber what's that an early uber an early oh yeah it's an early uber to get to where we're staying and then it's breakfast time breakfast, so, breakfast time. Right. we were not alone on this trip justin and michelle from misplaced overland was with us along with michelle's brother rod and his wife shannon we would made it to anchorage a day before our scheduled pickup from alaska overlander and decided to spend the day there just hanging out, getting acclimated to the time and things like that. But we had to get breakfast first, and this was incredible. For the rest of the day, we hung out at our Airbnb right off of Bootlegger Cove. This gave us a chance to kind of recuperate from the long flight and get ready for what the next day would be bringing. Since we still hadn't got our overland rental vehicles yet, it was time for yet another Uber. Soup for the rest of the week, so may as well have some pizza. How's your ride, Bill? Oh, it's great. I've got plenty of room. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and since we had no scuttle or camp chef or even a jet pool, we had to eat. Who could pass up a chance to eat at the famous Moose's Tooth? It's, it's, I don't know how it looks because that is the carnivore. Carnivore. The rest of the night was just spent hanging out at the Airbnb and getting ready for the morning. The next morning, we were up early to meet with Craig and Brooke from Alaska Overlander Rental. Brooke spent plenty of time with us showing us around the rigs and all the equipment that were in them. They have a selection of different Toyotas that you can choose from, from Forerunners to Tacomas and now a Tundra. All the units come very well stocked with everything you need for your overlanding adventure. After spending a few more minutes to just chat, we hopped in our respective rigs and made our way to the first stop of the trip. Yep, it was the epic sight of Golden Donuts. After grabbing a few dozen donuts, we made it back to the Airbnb to repack everything into our rigs and get on the road. The next thing we knew, we were headed south towards the Kenai Peninsula. Some of the employees at Alaska Overlander told us about this little restaurant in Girdwood, Alaska, and we had to stop and get their halibut. TV show at that line, where they were like, yeah, 
we're gonna write ATV. <laughs> that looks just as good though. How is it, dear? Mm. <laughs> Fishy? Really no. Fishy? No, no. No, it's wonderful. We got our stomachs full, left Girdwood, and made our way toward the Crow Creek Mine. Crow Creek Mine was once a bustling gold mine. It is now an interpretive site and a bit of a museum. Whatever you want to call it, it's definitely a step back in time. After leaving Crow Creek, we headed on down the Seward Highway. The plan for tonight was to camp somewhere around the Kenai Lake. We've kind of been on a roll lately about hitting popular places during holiday weekends. This one was no different, it was Labor Day weekend. We didn't find anything on Kenai Lake, but we did find a nice place on Cooper Lake, and that's where we set up for the night.
The next morning, we woke up to a spectacular view, our first camp night in Alaska. We generally don't like to schedule things or be on a schedule of any type, but today was a little bit different as we had scheduled a ferry ride from Whittier to Valdez. And after this, this would be the only thing that we had that was on a time frame. In order to get to the fishing town of Whittier, you have to drive through the Anton Anderson Memorial Tunnel. It's two and a half miles long, and it is the only way in and out of Whittier, either by car or train. This tunnel was built in 1943 and is still today North America's longest highway tunnel. Yo! Hey, we're coming by this big old boat. Where are you all at? What big old boat? A big old boat here in Whittier. We made it to Whittier in time to walk around a little bit and do some exploring and grab something to eat before it was time to catch our ferry on to Valdez. We boarded the ferry Aurora and it wasn't long at all before we had set sail through the Prince William Sound.
The sights on this cruise are just never ending, but it is six and a half hours long, and they do have a restaurant with a place to eat and some lounges to be able to just sit back and relax and enjoy the view from the windows. We made it to the beautiful port of Valdez at about 7 p.m. After making landfall, we stopped and grabbed a couple items that we had forgotten to pick up and then started looking for camp. We found a couple little places like this just off the road, but once we got out to the end of it where the river was, it was really soft and just didn't feel like that it was going to be an adequate place to camp for the night. Starting to feel like we're back on the East Coast. Yeah. After not finding a good place to camp along the river, we went ahead and made our way up through Keystone Canyon along the Richardson Highway. And that's where we found the beautiful Bridal Veil Falls. There are several falls along this route, such as Horsetail and Ruddleson. The Brattleville Falls, however, is the largest and most photographed of them all. After stopping to take some time to admire the falls, we made our way on out Keystone Canyon, heading towards the Thompson Pass. Hold on, I think I found it. By the time we had got to Thompson Pass, it was definitely getting dark and it was time to find camp. We found a great place, but didn't have a whole lot of light to shoot much video. While we weren't able to capture a whole lot of video that night, we were able to capture some pretty amazing photographs. The next morning, we woke up hoping to see some of the beautiful sights along Thompson Pass, but we woke up to very dense fog. The prior day's sunshine was gone, and today was heavy fog, clouds, and rain. 
We had some coffee, but decided to forego cooking breakfast because of the weather. We broke down camp pretty quick and got on the road. We made it north across the Thompson Pass, and that's when we decided to stop and check out the Worthington Glacier. This glacier is almost four miles in length and is one of the easiestly accessible in the state of Alaska. We continued our way up the scenic Richardson Highway until we found the turnoff to go towards Kinney Lake. Kinney Lake's a spot on the map, but it's pretty much just this store, laundromat, campground, and hotel. It's also the last place that you'll find to be able to get fuel and any last minute provisions before you start making your way to McCarthy. One site that's easily missed if you're not watching is Liberty Falls, and this is on the road to McCarthy. Not only was the water crystal clear and the fall stunning, but the plant life around it was so vibrant. By the time we made it to Chitna, skipping breakfast, we were all pretty hungry and it was time to try to find something to eat. Well, this may kind of look like a ghost town. We weren't the only people there traveling through. Not much was open in the big town of Chitna except for this roadside food place here it happened to be their last day open before they closed for the winter, and man, was it a treat. Holy moly. Now you guys are fighting over the vault toilet. <laughs> that is awesome. That looks amazing. Whoa. That is amazing. a lot. Bill, you want to buy, try a bite of... Um, no. <laughs> We once again ate way too much for lunch, but we were now firmly on our way to McCarthy. The McCarthy Road between Chitna and McCarthy is about 60 miles long and it's all gravel. Some of it is a little rougher than others, but it's all very scenic.
We made it to McCarthy and got a really nice camp spot right along the Kennecott River. Well, this campsite was not as remote as we would have liked to have had it. We were still within walking distance of McCarthy. Kind of surprised me, but even with the clouds as low as they were, there were still tour planes out showing people around. After getting camp set up, we walked our way up to McCarthy to find something to eat and see what was going on. This town definitely had a free spirit and was one of the most unique places that I have ever seen. After having another very good dinner at the Potato, it was time to make our way on into downtown McCarthy, past the Golden Saloon and Ma Johnson's Hotel. After taking the grand tour of McCarthy, we decided it was time to make our way back towards camp. The walk back to camp was almost a mile long. It was flat, so it wasn't very hard hiking at all, but it was raining. Back across the walk bridge over the Kennecott River we went, and then it was time to get a fire started to get warmed back up. The next morning we woke up to clearing skies, snow-capped mountains, and a roaring river. So, Chef Justin, we what? have we Bill, we have bought um, a fair amount of groceries and not cooked any of them. Right. Yesterday we went to have sandwiches. The refrigerator was set incorrectly or just not operating. Froze all the sandwich meat. Today we're going to cook some of the food that we bought. So today is is uh, potatoes and reindeer sausage on the griddle for breakfast. This reindeer sausage. Yeah, we're doing a little coffee right now and. Um, get some coffee going for everybody and then we're gonna we're gonna cook it up we're gonna have a hearty breakfast before our hikes and exploration today up on the mine and up on the glacier so sounds good yeah we're ready we're ready all right i don't know who's got the potatoes or who has the sausage but we're gonna need those <laughs> items What is that, Justin? Got little taters, and then we did uh, we did the reindeer sausage this morning, um, and it's the reindeer sausage we had at one of the restaurants locally, and it's fantastic. So we can make a nice hearty breakfast. Justin, that's gonna be really good on the crowd, isn't it? Put a little onion on there. Mm -hmm. We're sitting on the Kennecott River. I know it's awesome, isn't it? We we're so fortunate. The clouds completely went away and the sun came out for another beautiful day. This is a full beauty salon at this joint. We don't go 
little shorthanded here. After breakfast and everybody got ready, we decided to hike back into town. This was going to be another special day because we were going to be going to the Kennecott Mine. Going back over to McCarthy also gave us a better opportunity to check out some of this town and its history in sunny skies rather than rain. pit bull. <laughs> Attacked or licked to death? Well, forcefully <laughs> licked. I say, let's not talk like it was a vicious attack. <laughs> After exploring the town, we hopped on our shuttle to go to the Kennecott Mine. We got lots of footage there, but the sad part is, is it's a National Park Service, and we can't show it to you on YouTube. But I can tell you the Kennecott Mine Tour was one of the most detailed and spectacular tours that we have ever taken. Michelle, warming up my hand. What happened to it? Dysfunctional freezing. <laughs> you know, we, like, we like fried bologna, not frozen bologna. Fried bologna, that's not good. I know. After thawing out our lunch meat, we had sandwiches and then packed up and started making our way back out of McCarthy. But not before reading our notes from our friends from Iowa. If you ever get a chance, ask one of us the story about the ladies from Iowa. I'll give you a little hint. These ladies were in this big camper that's behind us right here and followed us pretty much all the way through Alaska. We had a beautiful afternoon and evening to make our way back out of McCarthy, back towards Chitna and Kenny Lake. That's a cold mountain in front of us. We got back to Kenny Lake and decided to take advantage of the little campground here and also gave us time to get showers and cook a nice dinner on top of a wood fire. Sure would be nice to have a light ranger, wouldn't it? I can't see. Looky there, looky there. It's very good. They kick the shit out of that Johnson, though. I don't know what he was thinking. <laughs> the next morning, we broke camp really early and got on the road. We were heading north along the Richardson Highway. The next stop was going to be a very special one. After nearly a full day of driving on the blacktop, it was time to get on the dirt. Now what we found so far with our time in Alaska is all roads either connect to population centers or they go out and back to a destination. And this one goes out to a destination that we definitely wanted to check out.
At the head of Miller Creek, we found the Canwell Glacier, and it was one of the most majestic places that we had ever been. After spending some time exploring this beautiful place, it was time to make our way back down off the mountain and try to start finding camp. This glacier extends for over 13 miles. You can still see the ice underneath all of the dirt and debris here. The glacier, as it starts to melt, the water seeps down through the rock and debris that was pushed down through the valley, and the rock and debris is actually left on top. That's why it looks like there's no ice underneath it, except in places you can see those small cracks. They say you never know what you're going to find in Alaska, and we actually found this helicopter just sitting in the middle of nowhere. But the A-Star wasn't the only thing that was flying around today. We found a bunch of eagles at a fish hatchery enjoying their evening dinner. By early evening, we found a place to set up a cold camp along the Denali Highway. We managed to escape a lot of the weather today, and it was fairly dry, but that wasn't going to last long because the wind was picking up and the rain was sure to come. After hot dogs on the fire, everybody just kind of stood around and waited out the wind and the rain. Soon it got dark and we decided to go on to bed. That night was the coldest night that we had had so far. The morning wasn't any warmer and it wasn't a whole lot drier. Everything was still very wet from the night before. We decided not to fix breakfast here, to make our way on out the Denali, and the first place we could find, we were going to stop and get some breakfast. Just past the Tangle River, we found the Tangle Lakes Lodge, and it was open for breakfast. You see gas anywhere? What is the doorbell here, banjos? Might be. You ready for some cocktails? I'm ready for anything at this point. <laughs> 
Well, we didn't have any cocktails. We did have a very good breakfast, complete with bacon and reindeer sausage. After a delicious breakfast and hot coffee, it was time to get back into the cold and damp parts of the Denali Highway. I know you're probably thinking, well, all they did was eat while they were up there. We did a lot of it, but how do you pass up cinnamon rolls like this? We figured out how to pass them up. We got full on this huge burger and bowls of soup. We had another incredible meal here, but right after that, we headed to the Denali National Park. We can't show you that, though, because of federal regulations. This was a place that the guy built, and it was supposed to be a motel. Then, oh, yeah, then he ran out of money. The good news is somebody supposedly bought this property, and it's actually supposed to be built next year. Where, what, see where my phone's at right there, that angle? Like towards that tree, it would be just about right directly behind that tree right there. Hmm. We continued our way south along the George Parks Highway, hoping to catch a glimpse of Mount Denali but the clouds were definitely covering it up. As the sun started to pop out finally, we turned west, making our way towards Petersville. According to the 2020 census, Petersville has a population of 27 people. Nowadays, this road is known as the other road to Denali. It was originally built in the 20s for mining. I think we've graduated from moose country to bear country now.
We had gotten up early this morning and put a lot of miles on for the day. We got to the head of Cash Creek and decided to turn around and go back to a little campsite that we had found beside Peters Creek and set up camp for the night. It had been a long day and we were all ready to just park the vehicles. As we turned around and were looking at the map, we realized through this pass we could possibly see Mount Denali. The only problem was there was a lot of clouds. We were hoping by the next morning things would clear up to where we could see her. It was going to be another chilly evening, so we got a fire put together pretty quick while Justin and Shannon fixed dinner. We're on day six here in Alaska, and we have rain jackets that smell like mold. And we have pants that are smell like smoke, boots in here that are nasty smelling. So we are going to try out the O3 Outdoor. It is in their bag that you can get from them. Um, and it's a nice bag. It has zippers everywhere, pockets everywhere. We actually use these on our as our luggage that we had checked. So we're going to go ahead and clean this out. We've already used this in the car with some other items. So I'm just going to hold this down, turn it on, and push the button until I get to 30 minutes. I'm going to place it in the bag here and zip it in. And when it comes out, it kind of has a little bit of a, like a pool chlorine smell. And that goes away and everything is just has no scent whatsoever. No smoke, no sweaty stuff, no mildewy smell. So we're going to leave that in there 30 minutes and get that all freshened up. Looky there. The chef right goo himself. Oh yeah. I had Julia. Don't a little bit of that, that extra sauce over there. I had Julia Child over here helping me out. But Gosh, that's a I'll lot. I'll never be able to eat all that. I think, I think we can do it. Track. I think you can do it. We're going to try. 2.30. Wow, they raised it? No, that's in flight suit. Well, maybe someone else gave up two pounds from it. <laughs> 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 maybe call one of your buddies that works. <laughs> when Justin got up the next morning, he was able to see the top of Mount Denali. By the time we got up, we weren't able to see it because of the clouds. But what we did get to see is this bear eating some blueberries on the side of the mountain across from our camp. Is there another one? Is there another one there? No, I... Oh, there's one over here. You stood up? Well, way up there. Yeah. Can you see him go up? See that? A little better. We couldn't see him very well from where we were, so I decided to fly the drone up to get a little better vantage point of him. We stayed well away from him and made sure not to disturb him. Meanwhile, back at camp, it was fresh blueberry pancakes. I'm the same way with my toast. I don't like my toast like real. Fresh picked, huh? So we're truly embracing Alaska. Not only do I have my Elmer Fudd hat on, we've got blueberry pancakes where skinny Right here, Went and got the, the blueberries right out of the woods. Fresh pick. Right there they are, fresh picked. And we're going to go with the Alaska birch syrup. Us and the bear were not the only ones having breakfast. This little critter here also had found him something to eat. 
After a great breakfast, we decided to get back on the road, and our next stop was going to be Talkeetna. As we started up the road to Talkeetna, we were treated to a great surprise. We were able to see the top of Mount Denali between the clouds. Now this was a real treat because only 30% of visitors to Alaska get to see the peak. We made it to Talkeetna just in time to see the Alaska Railway starting to make its departure to the north. Talkeetna is a very unique town with a lot of history, food, and shops. We had had all kinds of local cuisine throughout Alaska, but we hadn't had any pizza since the moose's tooth, so it was time for another slice. After lunch, we did some more exploring into the history of Talkeetna and some of the museums around, and we even checked out one of the replicas of Mount Denali. Talkeetna was a really cool town to visit, but it was time to find another cool place. Next on our list was Hatcher Pass and the Independence Mine. The closer we made it to Hatcher Pass, the more overcast it got and started raining, and then by the time we got to the top, it was snowing. At an elevation of almost 3,900 feet, Hatcher Pass is only open a few months out of the year. <laughs> we are in the snow, hiking in Alaska. It's only 10 degrees cold than it was when we started today. After a short and chilly hike, we made our way down the south side of the pass towards the Independence Mine. Gold was found in this area as early as 1897, but the gold mining actually had its heyday in this area in the Independence Mine in the early 1930s and 1940s. This mine ended up being the second largest hard rock gold mine in the state of Alaska. There was at one time up to 16 structures on the side of this mountain, and they were all connected by tunnels that were built by wood so that people could move throughout the buildings during the winter. 
The company ended operations in 1950 with expectations of the mill being started back up, but it never happened. In 1974, it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places and is now the Independence Mine State Historic Park. As we walk through, you could truly get a taste of what it may have been like to live and work here back almost 100 years ago. And now, this is one of the most complete ghost towns or displays that we have seen.
We took several steps back in time today, and we decided to actually retrace part of our steps. We went back across Hatcher Pass to a campsite that we had seen on the way in, and it was right beside the creek. It couldn't be more perfect for tonight. The biggest treat was as we made our way back across Hatcher Pass, the sun was starting to peek out so we could see the tops of the mountains through the pass. We found a great little campsite right along Willow Creek. I should have got it when you threw it on the ground. That's when I should have got it. <laughs> The menu for dinner for tonight was pretty simple. Either chili or Denny Moore stew with grilled cheese sandwiches. <laughs> what an awesome day of looking back at the history of the early Alaskan pioneers. It made me look like a fool, but we got it. After Justin got the outhouse figured out and put away, it was time to get on the road. We had big plans for this morning. As we left camp, we got lucky once again and were able to see the top of Denali. We could have saved a whole lot of money on this trip by just cooking at camp, but we really wanted to taste the flavor of Alaska as well and not just experience it. After another hearty breakfast, we went to see Matthew Fowler of the 17th Dog Dog Sled Team at Alaska Adventures. Matthew and his wife Liz has not only created a relationship around the dogs, but also a business. Matthew participates in the Iditarod race every year, and they have Alaska Adventure Tours here so you can see the dogs, and it helps fund their race business. When you come to check out the dogs, the first thing you do is get a little bit of a history lesson about the dogs, about how they're bred, how they're raised, and what their breed type is like. Well, these dogs aren't your typical Huskies. These are Alaska sled dogs, and they are born and bred to work and to mush. So the dogs that we're using are they're an extreme butt, and they're bred for everything but appearance, attitude, appetite, their strength, their health. Do they have arthritis? Then you don't breed that dog. Do they have a hip dysplasia? You don't breed that dog. So for those of you that went to Denali and saw the, the sled dogs at their, at their camp, um, those are a little bit different than ours, although they're the same breed because their genetic pool is very small. It'd be like if Kentucky only drafted players from Kentucky. Second sled, if your sled breaks, you can have a second, a second sled on the trail. After a thorough history lesson in dog sledding, it was time to go out and meet the pups. Finished the Iditarod last year. And baby Grand, that, that one there, he'll hopefully go next year. Yeah, you hired Oh, you're a leader? You've been a leader? Oh, pretty Red, what's you doing? What's going on, man? He's finished nine Iditarods. Finished nine Iditarods. 
He likes to work with me. He's one of them. He's trained all these dogs. And they pick on him? We had scheduled our tour a little bit too late to be able to get a ride on the training mushers, but we did get to watch them hook it up, and that's when the dogs really got excited. There was another group that was getting ready to take off on one of the training rides. Nonverbal communicators. So just a simple, you know, action of doing something. That they, they already know what's happening. Sonic and McLaren. Sonic, funny how you can remember the end of the game. Once the two dog teams left, it was time for us to get a little bit more one-on-one -on -one time with some of the dogs. And Matthew also showed us a little bit more around the complex and some more history. I don't run off, no. Only once in a while if I haven't, you know, I mean, you know, they're dogs, so they're, I'm changing a few things that fit my style more. But I mean, did, was there a lot of people sick and that kind of thing? Oh, or, or did... Ride here so I can stream Netflix. And nice. Stream and you got your fire back here. So you <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then your bus warm too, right? Yep. Uh huh. So this is your oven. When I say oven, I mean you. You can. Yeah, you can. Wow. You could cook on the go. I built a sled one year and tried to cook on the go, but it was kind of hard. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, this is. It's all homemade. I mean, the only thing I bought was this thing. Uh -huh. And you don't, okay, they, they provide you with the with the heat so you can pour that in here. And this is what burns. It'll burn for about 10 or 15 minutes. And um, it's temperature sensitive. So this, it burns very slow. With one match, you'll have a fire. You don't need I've to like- I've never heard of that before. The heat? It's gas line antifreeze. It's gas line uh, antifreeze. It's alcohol, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's got. But what's great about it is it will not freeze. So yep. yeah, exactly. But it'll, huh. it's super flammable. Yep. So the next time we're out somewhere, we can't find any lighter fluid. There you go. There you go. <laughs> now I don't know how it would react in the summertime. In huh. the winter, it doesn't. Like I'm not sure in the summertime. Never. I think driving. you might want to use the red bottle in the summertime because yeah. it might react differently. Huh. But so you get the fire going, and then you scoop up some snow. And you set that in there, and then, you know, you got all your dog bowls, and as you're, so now you're camped, you're sitting here, like, taking care of the dogs, getting their water going, and I'm going to open up my bag and get out all my frozen meat, and I've already cut it ready to go in tiny little strips so it can thaw out and melt fast. So you're just putting snow in that, melting it down for get water in, exactly. the, in the pan. Yep. He's going to make a stew basically for the yep. dogs. And then you add the kibble, probiotics, meat in there, and you lay out the bowls and mix it all up, add the hot water, and then you can feed the dogs right on the line. And then you have to make sure they all eat, you know, because if they don't have enough fuel, they won't have enough energy to go on the next 50 mile run. <coughs> and you might have to then say, well, you didn't want beef. All right, do you want salmon? Now you, you want chicken. What What is it? Tell me what you like want. Kids. You're like, uh, <laughs> what do you eat? <laughs> yeah, and then I have leftover food from, from dinner, you know, I, and I vacuum seal it, and it's like a burrito or, you know, chicken alfredo or something. Mm -hmm. I usually have hot water left over, and then I'll set my 
my frozen meal in there in the vacuum mm -hmm. seal bag and then I'll cut it open and eat that. Um, and then you got to get them to bed. So while this is melting, you're massaging their wrists. You're looking at their at their feet, making sure they don't have any like splits or anything or issues. You know, I'm sure like your dog might step on a rock or okay. step on a thorn, and you have all kinds of salve, and, um, all kinds of stuff. You know. And so, if one of the dogs can't continue, you'll just make room. You'll open up your bag and push everything to the front. There's little dividers in here. And this space is for one dog. And you'll keep it, you can open that up and access them and see how they're doing. And they can stick their head out while you're moving. Is that just for like your personal storage then? Yep. Yep. And this is also your tent. So when you're camping, you can offload everything and I can crawl in here and sleep in here if I wanted to. So if it's like really windy or something. So you make your sled bag as tall as you are. So you can get in here in a windstorm. So that's another thing you have to teach them too, is to ride in that. Yep, exactly. So yeah. we, before the race, we'll teach the dog to get in here, you know, and mm -hmm. give them a treat when they calm down. But you still make your sleds? I've made, I haven't made one in a while. I made like <laughs> maybe four. Um, this last one I broke down and bought a sled. We learned a lot more about the details of how a dog sled team actually works. But the real treat was this. When we got to pet and hold all the new puppies. Did she have all of hers or did she lose any? She didn't lose any. Mommy. Aww. Aww. We're just starting. You better get one Michelle before she burns. This is the wild man. This is the wild one? He's the wild man. That's what you perfect. Deb put that with Aspen. I got a wild one. This one looks like the dad. The dad looks like this and there's a lot of black in the line. Yay. So you keep all these for doing oh, yeah. stuff? Yeah, keep pretty, pretty excited. Oh, males or females work for you, don't they? That's right, yeah. Aww. Sure. They're so soft. Put my thing back. I'll put it in my pocket. Everybody's got one. I know the guy. So the only thing in the dog mushing world is we take the dew claws off. So that happened on day two or three. Okay. That's the only thing. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's a good, healthy doggy. Oh, yeah. They've been wormed already. And they'll get their first shots maybe in another week. And three boys. <laughs> and we got to come up with. So, we were thinking, yeah, Ferris. I like, I like it. It's pretty cool. So, he, yeah. We, we designed it where we used to have two, two sets of spokes, you know, and so it would be. We had a great time with Matt and learning about his amazing dogs and the 17th dog team. If you're ever in this area, you really need to go check them out. It's a lot of fun and very informative. Next, we're headed south along the Cook Inlet, making our way towards the Kenai Peninsula. And that's when we spotted beluga whales off in the water. This was a real treat. There was actually a wildlife biologist there that had been chasing down in search of these beluga whales. And she told us that there were only 331 of them known to be in existence at this point. And for us to be able to get to see a whole school of them was really neat to watch. After leaving Cook Inlet, we followed along the beautiful waters of the Kenai River, making our way on towards the end of the Kenai Peninsula. This was our last night in Alaska, and we wanted it to be very special. So we wanted to camp on the farthest place that you could drive west in North America. We met at Acre Point just before sunset, and we took an incredible walk along the beach. Cool. 
I mean, it was cool enough to be able to drive to the farthest place we could in North America, but to be, a, be able to see an active volcano off in the distance was something else. A walk on the beach and a campfire is the perfect way to end our last night here in Alaska. The next morning, Deb and Michelle were up just before daylight to take another walk along the beach. This time they were hoping to find more treasure than they did last night. Right after the stroll on the beach, we packed up pretty quick. We had one more stop that we wanted to make before we finished our trip here in Alaska. We wanted to go to Hummer. But we're first, we stopped to read a little bit of the history about Anchor Point. Now I know we're normally cursed with rainy weather, but it seemed like on this trip, every time we had somewhere that we wanted to get out and look at something, the weather cooperated with us, at least partially. And that was the same thing that looked like might happen today. And today was no different than any other day. We had to find some local flavor to try out. This happened to be an incredible coffee shop and pastry place. Continuing out to the Homer Spit, we could see rain off into the distance. We were just hoping that it was going to stay away just long enough for us to check this amazing little harbor town out. This place was full of shops where you could get all kinds of different foods, you could get whatever kind of souvenirs you wanted, and you could even book tours into Ketchumac Bay. As we walked back out onto the boardwalk and seen the rainbow off in the distance, we just kind of knew that the weather was going to play nice with us for the rest of the day. We thoroughly enjoyed our time at Homer, but it was now time to start making our way back towards Anchorage. 
Today was going to be the day that we were going to have to drop off the rental vehicles, and tonight we'll be flying back to the lower 48. This has been a truly exceptional trip, but we had been missing that one thing, the elusive moose. And on the way back, we were so fortunate to find this one beside the road eating. Okay, that's good, he's right here. Seeing the moose made our trip complete. Now, it was time to do the same thing that we've been doing the whole trip, and that was grab something else to eat on our way back to Anchorage. And we had to finish it off with some more halibut. We have thoroughly enjoyed our time in Alaska, and most people think that this is a trip that's not obtainable. But with Craig and Brooke and the Alaska Overlander Rentals, having to be able to rent a complete vehicle makes it certainly attainable and not much more expensive than a standard vacation. They have a top of the line fleet of vehicles that are very well taken care of and completely outfitted for pretty much any family or any need that you might have. You can find them at alaskaoverlander.com. With dropping off for vehicles, it was time to get back in the air and make our way back home. This trip has been one of a lifetime. We hope that you've enjoyed following along as much as we've enjoyed going. Until next time, see ya.